Thank you very much, Ines, and thanks very much also for the organizers to inviting me back, which I hope is a sign that the first time wasn't so bad that they never want to hear of me again. So I thought I would pick up on some of the issues I addressed last time in the context of sovereignty, connecting three of my favorite hobby horses, Brexit, sovereignty, and EU constitutional law, um, and linking it also to the topic of this, this conference, to what extent is withdrawing from the EU a fundamental right? Um, and to what extent does it have a certain absolute status, which would raise, at least in my mind, a couple of questions about the nature of EU constitutional law. Now, as a kind of caveat, first of all, I am going into a topic that I enjoy very much, so just stop me if I go too fast or too deep or stop making sense. But the more fundamental problem is whether I'm wondering whether I'm slowly going crazy. Um, so this is also a test. Now. My mentor once told me that a good lawyer can do two things. He can make something extremely complex very simple, and he can make something very simple very complex. Now, the second one is more the, the obstructive role of the lawyer. I try to do the first one as an academic, but I wonder what I'm doing here today is the second one, whether I'm reading too much in something that is actually very simple. And in a world where we already have Trump running for re-election and Boris Johnson as the most likely new prime minister, I need more sanity, not less. So um, this is also a reality check. If you think I'm actually overdoing, over-interpreting, just let me know, and I can go on and spend my time on something more constructive. So um, Whiteman, uh, as a, just a general background, December of last year, the Court of Justice ruled that, shortly put, a member state can first indicate it wants to withdraw and then revoke its notification to withdraw. So effectively, the UK can still withdraw its notification of withdrawal and remain a full member state. Right? That's the short summary. What I wonder about is how the Court of Justice motivated this, the underlying reasoning and the nature of the right to withdraw, and the consequences for EU law. Now, ooh, let me just, ah, that helps. Yes. Um, as a starting point conceptually, someone I respect very much in terms of his knowledge of EU law, this is something that Kuhn Leinart said already in 1990. And then, of course, he started helping making it a reality. Um, basically, in, in his article on federalism and the EU, he said there simply is no nucleus of sovereignty that the member states can invoke as such against the community. Now, this is the kind of conceptual starting point I want to take. I think by now this is the dogma in EU law. Um, as a member state, you simply cannot argue your own sovereignty against EU law. You cannot say that the specific um, redistribution of migrants is against your sovereign laws. You cannot argue that free movement is against a sovereign constitutional value. Sovereignty as such is not a valid argument against EU law. So let me unpack that a little bit. How has this been operationalized in EU law? Now, of course, we have to start with the classics. Sorry, as an EU law professor. Maybe as, a, as some EU quiz, does anyone know why I chose the picture of an espresso here? I warn you, if you know this, you're a true EU nerd like me. Any idea? Mrs. Costa actually challenged her electricity bill and the actual monetary value of the amount she was disputing is about the price of an espresso. So we got the entire doctrine of supremacy roughly for the price of an espresso, which I think is cheap. Now, of course, in Costa Inel, we have the Court of Justice famously stating that the EU is a new legal order for the benefit of which member states have limited their sovereign rights. Although the Court of Justice then adds, um, albeit within limited fields, right? But this was, of course, for some Eurosceptics, the original sin. The EU actually elevates itself into a new legal order that trumps national law. Now, the Court of Justice then got increasingly cheeky, one could say. So in Maloney, which concerned uh, tax evasion, um, the Court of Justice, just for clarity's sake, stressed again, yes, even of a constitutional order. So EU law trumps national law, no matter what level, no matter whether it's your constitution or even the core of your constitution. If it's an irrigates clausel or not, doesn't matter. Okay, so that's pretty well known. In Whiteman, they actually start, sorry, I'm still trying to get over my Boris Johnson uh, problem. Um, 
And in Whiteman, the court actually restates this, this standard line of case law, right? Member states have limited their sovereign rights, although the court now refers to the phrase as it became after Lever, in ever wider fields. So if you remember, first we had limited the sovereign rights within limited fields, and now it has become ever wider fields, right? Since a couple of decades. Of course, ever wider being open and not having any limit as such. So Whiteman in itself first refers to this standard doctrine, this dogma of EU law, that you cannot use sovereignty against it. Now, importantly, the court has also held that this applies to the use of national competences. Um, it's, of course, one question whether EU law always trumps national law. Another question is whether you should always respect EU law. Now, again, I'm repeating basic law here, but the Court of Justice has repeatedly said yes. You always have to respect EU law whenever you act within the scope of EU law, even if the competence has not been transferred to the EU. So even if you're applying a purely national competence, you have to respect EU law if EU law may otherwise be affected. And that applies to the most sensitive areas you can think of. An early example is Compass Oil, which concerned strategic oil reserves and oil refinery capacity in Ireland. And there, basically, the Court of Justice refuted the argument of the Irish government that oil reserves are simply of a vital importance. And notice the terminology Ireland even uses um, for the life of the country. Now, I think that's as strong as you can get, right? The very existence of Ireland was on the line. Now, maybe the Court of Justice didn't believe that, but this is what Ireland argued. And the Court simply says, well, okay, on the one hand, we have the life of the country, but your measures imposing certain uh, minimum tariffs for refinery um, actually violate the free movement of goods, and free movement of goods applies, even though there is absolutely no competence for the EU to regulate strategic oil reserves. So we have to balance free movement of goods versus the life of Ireland, and in this case, the free movement of goods won out. Right? So this is, uh, I'm giving you some of the, the flavors of the standard approach. Um, the same in Schemp, we move forward a little bit. Uh, um, now we have taxation. Of course, we know direct taxation does not fall within the competence of the EU. However, member states have to apply their taxation laws in line with EU law. And again, for Ireland, that has led to some severe consequences. We have the Apple case now. We see the Commission using state aid increasingly to circumvent or at least to, to constrain member state tax use. Now we have a recent ruling against the UK where even the use of normal uh, national uh, legislation on, on uh, businesses was deemed inappropriate state aid, illegal state aid. So we see that also on tax, which I think is one of the most fundamental national sovereign powers that member states want to retain, the court simply says, no, you have to apply EU law. And don't we have a new shield then? Uh, this is the way some people, sorry for my science fiction nerdery here, um, we have a kind of force field against EU law. With Lisbon, we can use national constitutional identity, and the Court of Justice quickly relieved us of that um, imagine, well, that feat of imagination saying, no, constitutional identity is a construct of EU law, which means that you cannot use it against EU law. Um, one example is Sein Wittgenstein, where we had one person with the name Fürstin in her actual surname. That's not allowed in Austria, where um, you cannot have any nobility titles anymore. Um, and then Austria said, well, this is part of our national constitutional identity. And the Court of Justice said, fine, but we're simply going to use that as a way of weighing, again, just like in free movement, on the one hand, you violate free movement of persons. On the other hand, you have a national interest, namely um, no longer accepting ability titles, which is part of your constitutional identity. So we'll give it a serious look, but we are the ultimate judges. And again, you understand where the Court of Justice is coming from, because if a member state could just say, you know, this is our constitutional identity, so EU law doesn't apply, then the court loses all power. You could say anything is your constitutional identity, and the court would lose out. So you, you, you know why the Court of Justice is doing this. Conceptually, it is difficult for the court to let go of this absolute supremacy, 
But at the same time, to prevent this possible abuse, the court is laying down a very far-reaching, absolute concept that I think is increasingly rubbing against um, some Eurosceptic populations. Now, together, I think this pretty much conforms to the paradigm, right? EU law trumps national law always, ever, right? It's the easiest question I can always ask in exam. Does EU law trump this national law? You can always say yes without even thinking. Now, this is why I was a bit surprised by Whiteman, and this is where my doubts started. Um, so, really. Now, one of the, my hobbies, and I know it's a sad hobby, <clears throat> is looking for examples where the Court of Justice secretly does not conform to its own doctrines on supremacy. Because sometimes even the Court of Justice doesn't want to allow something, but then it usually uses different terminology. So think, for example, of case law on res judicata. In Kapferer, basically the court says, we respect res judicata, even if that violates EU law. Now, it doesn't mention supremacy, but of course that is a limit on supremacy. It just means that national procedural autonomy, legal certainty is more important than supremacy. Um, Whiteman, I wonder the same thing about um, the move, the right to take it back, the right to actually remain a member state of the EU. Now, um, what I want to do is go through a couple of paragraphs that I think are uniquely pro-sovereignty. Right? If you would read these paragraphs, you wouldn't immediately think you were reading the Court of Justice's case law. And then think a little bit about what that means. Now, the Court of Justice basically said, yes, you have a right to withdraw, but crucially, it was a unilateral right to withdraw. So the UK can withdraw without the EU being able to consent or not. The European Council cannot say, we do not accept your withdrawal. Why? If you require consent, you turn the right to remain in the, in the EU, the right to withdraw your notification of withdrawal, into a consensual act, and you give other member states the power to kick someone out. Just imagine that the UK says, we want to stay in, and the Council would say no, then the UK would leave the EU without a deal on the Article 50, and we would have kicked out the EU against its will. Uh, sorry, the UK. We cannot kick the EU out of the EU, I think. Um, so I think the court up front was clear about where it wanted to go, right? It was clear that the court wanted to accept a unilateral right to withdraw your, your notification. Um, now, the problem was the main argument from the council from the Commission and from most of the intervening member states was that this would undermine the structure of Article 50. Article 50 says, once you notify, you have two years. You can extend not the period, but to extend the period, you need unanimous consent from the other 27 and the UK. Now, if you can withdraw your notification and re-enter your notification, you can simply restart the two-year period. So they said this if you can revoke unilaterally and then resubmit a new notification, you basically undermine the requirement of consent to extend the period. Plus, why would you need consent for the more limited act, extending, and not need consent for the more far-reaching act, namely withdrawing? So this is what the Court of Justice had to overcome, so to speak. And to overcome this, my assessment would be that the court focused completely on sovereignty and democratic self-determination, saying the reason why you cannot require consent and the reason why you cannot compare extending the negotiation period to withdrawing a notification is because questions of leaving or remaining are absolute sovereign decisions by their very nature. And because they are so sovereign and unilateral, we cannot impose any limit in terms of consent. Now, so I've selected the paragraphs where the Court of Justice goes into this sovereignty aspect, and I'm still, well, to be honest, my research assistant is doing this, but well, we're still looking into whether this is indeed the case where the Court mentions sovereignty the most times in, in EU law. Uh, five times, paragraph 50. So the decision to withdraw is for that member state alone to take in accordance with its constitutional requirements and therefore depends solely on its sovereign choice. Now, that doesn't really sound like the Court of Justice. Um, 
Take also into account, for example, case law on external relations, right? Where the court says, even if the commission is considering adopting a common position on giving a notification on a treaty, the duty of loyal cooperation kicks in and a member state is no longer allowed to unilaterally act on the international scene. So normally there's a hair trigger for taking into account EU interest, but here it's solely on the sovereign choice of the member state. Then in 56, we see here just how sovereign and alone Theresa May is in Brussels these days, waiting for her European Council colleagues to take a decision. Paragraph 56, it follows that Article 50 pursues two objectives. First, enshrining the sovereign right of a member state to withdraw from the European Union. Again, they focus on this first objective of Article 50, and they say it is to protect the sovereign right. And this is actually very much in line with the travaux. If you see the preparatory works for Article 160, the predecessor of Article 50 in the Convention, then you see indeed that this was very much a symbolic recognition of ultimate member state sovereignty. The idea was that the EU was going to develop and integrate ever deeper, and as a compensation, member states got this exit button. You know, the sovereign Article 50, if you want to regain your sovereignty, just press the button and you're out of the EU and you're fully sovereign again. Now, we can, of course, seriously debate whether that is being sovereign, whether the UK will be very sovereign under Prime Minister Boris Johnson once they have left the EU without a deal on November 1st. Um, but that's, that's a question on the def definition of sovereignty, so I'm not going to go there. The court just here focuses on the sovereign right to withdraw. And then in 57, the sovereign nature of the right of withdrawal supports the conclusion that the member state concerned has a right to revoke the notification of its intention to withdraw from the European Union. Again, why can you unilaterally revoke? Because withdrawal is a sovereign decision. So sovereignty seems to be the underlying argument, the ultimate normative justification for the court's choice. And then Article 59, we get really sovereign here. So this was just my mental image when reading the case. The revocation of a member state of its intention to withdraw reflects a sovereign decision by that state to retain its status as a member state of the European Union. The court keeps repeating just how sovereign this decision is. Now notice, by the way, of course, there's a bit of an imbalance joining the EU is also a sovereign decision on the side of the member state, but of course, as I don't have to explain here, is n not unilateral, right? Far from it. And I certainly don't have to explain that to uh, Macedonia, uh, Northern Macedonia, um, that is still waiting accession. Now, and then to, t uh, to top it off, so as regards the proposal that the Council and the Commission had that the right of a member state to revoke should be subject to unanimous approval, so this is the parallel with the extension. That requirement would transform a unilateral sovereign right. So apparently we have sovereign rights and we have unilateral sovereign rights. This is a unilateral sovereign right into a conditional right subject to an approval procedure. So sovereignty is really the alpha and omega of the right to withdraw. I think I've made my point by now that the court mentions sovereignty a lot, right? I think you got it. Okay, now here comes my confusion. Um, you may know this image, you can actually see two things, a young woman or an older woman. Um, and this is a bit of the feeling I get when I look at the case. So what is the right to withdraw? Is it actually part of EU law or not? Is it a, um, a right? limited by EU law or not. Because on the one hand, the court says, we have here this unilateral sovereign right. On the other hand, the court then says, yes, but we will impose some limits because the court says, you can only withdraw your notification, written, it has to be clear, unequivocal, unconditional. So is it part of EU law? And if it, if it is part of EU law, how do we square that with a dogma that EU law doesn't recognize sovereignty as such? How do we fit an absolute sovereign right into EU law? Now, that led me to three ways of reading this case. I've probably read it too often. Um, the first reading would be, it's just a normal 
EU right. Article 50 gives member states the right to withdraw from the EU. Now, if Article 50 simply grants that right to withdraw or as a parallel to remain, that will mean that the right to withdraw falls in the scope of EU law and is therefore limited by EU law. But then, if it is simply limited by EU law, why can you not require consent? There are many rights that EU law grants that require consent. So there is no inherent reason why an EU right should not require consent. Right? So if EU law is simply, if the right to withdraw is a right granted by EU law, then the court's reasoning loses its force and it cannot justify why you cannot have consent or why other limits do not apply. One of the more practical questions after Whiteman is whether the right to revoke can be abused. What if the UK only submits a notification to restart the two-year period? So on October 31st, 11 o'clock, they send a note saying we revoke our notification and on November 1st, 9 o'clock, they send a new notice of withdrawal. Would that form an abuse? And would that abuse be disallowed under EU law? Now, what you see is that the Advocate General explicitly in the opinion says you cannot abuse your right to revoke and abuse is a limit to the right of revocation. The Court of Justice says nothing about abuse. It doesn't discuss it. So the question is, how do we interpret this silence? Well, under this first reading, abuse would simply apply because abuse is a general principle of EU law, right? Um, now, the second reading, it is a retained sovereign right. So member states always had the right to decide whether or not to be a member of international organizations. They never transferred that right to the EU so under the principle of conferral, the right to decide on membership has simply remained with the member states, and they have never transferred even the smallest part of that power to the EU. Hence, they retain this sovereign right to withdraw or remain. Of course, you probably know what I'm going to say next. Um, that would not change a thing, because as we just saw, the Court of Justice has happily said throughout the last 60 years, that no matter how sovereign or how national the right, EU law applies when you're within the scope of EU law. And I think few of you would dare to argue that deciding to withdraw from the EU is not a question that falls within the scope of EU law. I mean, Article 50 draws it squarely within EU law. So even if you say that it is a retained sovereign right of the most sovereign absolute nature, we still run into Costa, Simental, and the EU dogma. And it still doesn't explain why it is a unilateral right. Now, that led me to a third reading. Here I feel more like a priest interpreting some sacred text. But um, So let's say that it's a Big Bang kind of right. The right to remain or the right to withdraw is pre-Big Bang. It is an, a fundamental, ultimate, inherent sovereign right. It is such a sovereign right that it cannot be affected by EU law, right? Primordial, it doesn't depend on EU law, cannot be limited by it. Now, that seems to be the only kind of interpretation that fits the court's reasoning. This is why you cannot require consent. But then the problem is, yeah, first, if it is so primordial, it means that EU law cannot impose any limit. So even the limit in terms of writing, or the fact that it should be unconditional, or the fact that it should be unequivocal, how can you impose those limits? Because it's a primordial unilateral sovereign right. And the second question, if it is a really an absolute sovereign right, how do we fit that into EU law? And of course, a question I'm interested in, are there more? No, now that we've found a first alien, are there more of these unilateral absolute sovereign rights? So does it have any practical or theoretical implications? These were the theoretical implications. So can we see this as a recognition of ultimate member state sovereignty over the EU? So maybe is it a constitutional counterweight 
In contrast to cases on autonomy, supremacy, cases where the court goes full throttle into the EU stance, could this be an example of the EU court accepting a bit of national sovereignty, maybe also as a response to the popular outrage and your skepticism? Um, now, note, by the way, if you read it carefully, Whiteman only gives you the right to remain in the EU. And you can seriously question whether that is sovereign, right? It's like when your partner tells you, you have the right to remain married to me. Is that really independence? Um, now, maybe that's too early in the morning to reflect on those issues. But um, Are there more sovereign rights? And how can we fit this into the EU dogma? How does that fit conceptually? And can we actually use this as a platform together with national um, um, identity to counterbalance more EU-leaning mechanisms like supremacy, effectiveness, and loyalty? So can we come to a uh, balancing act where we actually balance some of the more absolute EU principles like supremacy against other EU principles so that we create more space for national sovereignty by balancing the absolutist EU principles against national principles. Of course, you keep the question who's allowed to do the balancing, but it may be one constructive way forward to create more legal space for national sovereignty without undermining these principles as such. Now, the practical consequences, um, and here again, I'm just wondering whether I'm going slightly crazy. Depending on your reading, abuse applies or not. Now, this may become relevant if the UK or the UK Parliament, whoever is Prime Minister or the Queen or whatever happens in the UK, decides to withdraw their notification. Um, is abuse applicable or not? And that also means, can the Council actually reject a withdrawal notification? Imagine that indeed the UK um, submits a withdrawal notification but by now the European Council has flipped towards the Macron line and says we don't trust the UK anymore. We, we think it should just end now. Could the European Council simply send back a letter saying no? We think your withdrawal is not unconditional. We think your withdrawal is not um, unequivalent enough. We reject your withdrawal notification. Now, the General Court has already held that the decision to accept the um, notice of withdrawal is not a formal decision you can challenge. But the question is, a decision by the European Council not to accept the withdrawal <laughs> notification, oh, I should stop talking now, um, so I'll take one more minute, would I think be a formal decision that you can challenge in front of the Court of Justice? Otherwise, you would have the crazy effect that according to the European Council, you're no longer a member state, but according to the member state, they are still a member state. We cannot let that situation exist. Or could you even challenge the two-year period itself? Because Article 50 imposes a two-year negotiation period. But if it's a unilateral right, a member state can simply say on day one, I'm going to leave now, if it's such a primarily unilateral sovereign right. So you undermine the entire two-year requirement. Um, right. So that was it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Armin. Are there any questions? Armin? Thanks. Um, Peter Arsch from Kassel. This is very interesting. Uh, could you qualify your step three, perhaps, by arguing that they haven't given up their sovereign right to, to uh, stay or leave, but they have um, agreed in modif uh, mo uh, modalities of that right? and uh, so sort of transferred some sort of sovereignty when it comes to the modalities, but not to the yes or no? Right. It's, um, should I answer immediately, or do you want to collect a couple of questions? Or, uh, okay. It's your wish. Okay. We can well, collect also. Yeah. No, it's, um, I, I, I'd like to delve into in this one. It's, um, so, one of the possible solutions I saw indeed is that you say either um, what the European Court imposes is not so much a limit on the right to withdraw, but just some formal technicalities that actually help you to determine whether you have actually 
used your right to withdraw your notification. For example, the fact that it must be in writing is just there to make sure that you have withdrawn. So it's not a limit on your yes or no power, but indeed a modality. The fact that it must be unconditional, again, is just a question, have you actually withdrawn or not? Because if you say, I will withdraw as long as you give uh, us a further rebate, then you may not have used your right to withdraw. However, the unequivocal and unconditional goes slightly beyond modalities, I think. Um, and even then, the court never accepts this distinction for other sovereign powers that member states have retained. So I don't think the court would say, well, you have retained the power to, reta to determine your national oil reserves. It's just the modalities of how you do that are now governed by EU law. Um, so it would still raise the ultimate question of how you could exclude the substance of this right from EU law, whether that's primordial or not. But it's indeed a nice exercise to see if you can chip away the absoluteness as far as possible. Uh, so thanks for that question. So maybe the, okay. It's just a thought uh, about how it was in USSR and how, for example, Baltic states went out of USSR. Mm -hmm. And it would be very interesting to compare this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because it's, it's really something very, how you, how in this big federal state, how, what someone wants change and yeah. what's happened. It's, uh, I think the, the EU might be slightly nervous about comparing it to the uh, uh, Soviet <laughs> Union because some people do it and they're not necessarily very uh, uh, pro-EU. But I think it's, it's an interesting comparison and, and this would be a next step. Um, one of the conceptual challenges that I haven't gotten my head around yet is whether this may be intrinsic to the right to leave. Because the right to leave is it, by its nature very strange. On the one hand, it's part of the thing you want to leave because you're leaving something. On the other hand, it is not part of the thing you want to leave because you decide to exit. So how can the very thing that you decide to exit control your exit? And unfortunately, historically, this has either been decided by force, if you look at the US, or in some cases, Soviet Union, that it turns into a factual question. Am I strong enough to keep you in? Um, because you also get the other factual question, what if a member state violates the law but then is out? Say that tomorrow um, Italy signs a notice saying we have left the EU as of now. Now, that may be a breach of EU law, it may be not, but what will we do? I mean, we have no European army to send in. Uh, we might send some civil servants, we may send a bill, uh, we may say, good luck, we're saving your banks and your economy, but what do we do? So it, it may be intrinsically in this, this, the nature of this right to withdraw. Um, so in that context, uh, I'm, I'm afraid my knowledge of the, of the Soviet uh, example is very limited, um, but it would indeed be interesting to, to explore that as such. Legal argumentation was on a very, very high level. Really? Yeah. Uh, when when we did it, yeah, yeah, it's it's a lot of interesting research on it. Yeah. So. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? No. So maybe I can uh, add some. Uh, maybe I think uh, turning the discussion in some other direction. Uh, uh, I think this time the court did a very good thing in terms of EU legitimacy because it respected actually the core sovereign rights of the state to decide about their political structure, to decide whether they will be members or not of uh, international organization, especially EU. For mm -hmm. Latvia, it's also a question of constitution, membership in the EU and also withdrawal from the EU. So I think it is uh, this core sovereign right which should be respe respected. Uh, on the other hand, I think in this Whiteman judgment, court also um, explored this EU side, unity of EU, because it referred to common European values, which is liberty and democracy, and also referred to the purpose of the whole European Union to create a union of people, of member states. So if we force somebody to withdraw, then we are actually destroying this union. So I think also this union side was taken into account. What do you think yeah. about it? 
No, um, when, the, when the case came out, there were quite some colleagues that were even angry and upset because there was a bit of a feeling that this was allowing the UK to hijack the EU even more, right? to keep going instead of posing a clear limit. On the other hand, I, personally, I must say that normatively, I very much agree with the outcome. And I think that's part of the challenge. I think the court normatively knew where it had to go. Because if you have the choice between kicking a member state out and keeping a member state in, I think it is inherent in the EU spirit and the objectives of the EU to keep a member state in. And the court has some very strong normative arguments. I mean, you mentioned the common values. I mean, one of the more funny parts is where the court refers to the ever closer union, because that's precisely the paragraph that Cameron wanted to remove um, from being applicable to the UK. And then that's part of the reasoning why they can stay. But the protection of EU citizenship rights, I mean, by kicking the UK out, you take away EU citizenship from 60 million people. And that is very un-European. Um, so I think there's very strong normative arguments to saying you can never kick a member state out against their, their will. Now, I think the problem the court had is how to fit this normative position into a legally convincing argument. And of course, again, I'm playing uh, a bit of a nasty trick. Courts are not there to answer theoretical conceptual answers. The court should not have given a conceptual treatise of 200 pages on the nature of the right to withdraw. I mean, that's what the Bundesverfassungsgericht does, and it gets us into all kinds of difficulties. So the court is not there to answer these kinds of questions. So this is not, a, not, a, not an attack on the court that it didn't think about this or should have settled this issue, right? That's too too easy. But I think for, for us trying to make a coherent whole, it does raise this conceptual question. So I think normatively I fully agree with you, and that leads us to the question how to solve our normative desires in a legally coherent way. Uh. Okay. Uh, thank you, Armin. Uh, I think we have all deserved a coffee break. Oh, oh sorry. Uh, yes. No? Okay. Please. <laughs> Oh dear, now you're the one that delayed coffee. <laughs> I can skip that, no problem. No, no. Um, Karola Glinski, Copenhagen. My question is still, I am not, not sure about your exact differentiation between your alternative two and, and three. Right. Whether it is a sovereign right, but play by the rules, or a primordial sovereign right, but modalities. Yeah. So what is the exact difference in your... Theory. So I think the, theoretical the, approach. I think the exact theoretical difference would be that it is actually outside the scope of EU law. So it's not that EU law allows them to do this. EU law is not even allowed to impose limits. Now, the modalities are then mere technicalities to see whether you have... So either the limits by the court can survive because they are pure technical modalities to assess whether you have exercised your right and they can never limit your right or they are substantive limits, but then they cannot apply. So under option two, the EU can substantively limit your right to withdraw, including by abuse conditionality. Under option three, the EU cannot do so. I would think that's the, the core difference. As, as a contract lawyer, where, where does Pacta Sunt Servanda come in? Yes. Well, thank you for that. This is one I've been struggling with um, uh, since my PhD that was in sovereignty. Um, and this is where international lawyers and constitutional lawyers also conflict. International lawyers simply say, this is not a problem of sovereignty. Uh, I mean, even if you're sovereign, if you promise something, you have to do it. And even Jean Baudin, the original, often claimed to be the original inventor of sovereignty as such, said that the sovereign is bound by his contracts. So he never saw contracts as a limit on sovereignty. Constitutional lawyers approach it from the other perspective because they approach it from the question whether the state power is limited. Now, granted, I don't think many constitutional lawyers sufficiently accept the degree to which, even if you have original sovereign power, it is limited by consent, by pacta sunt servanda, by treaties, by contracts. I mean, we did some research on the German budget, for example. More than 92% of the German budget is already predetermined by contracts, laws, other obligations. So the entire German budget that they think should be sovereign versus the EU is already bound by all kinds of laws 
and contracts internally. Um, but I think that reaches to a, a discussion on the nature of sovereignty. I would be in favor of a more factual concept of sovereignty as the power to influence your own destiny, not as a kind of abstract claim that you can determine whatever you want, which is not true for any entity in the real world, um, not even Donald Trump. Um, so, but indeed, so, but I don't think, in this sense, if EU law were to accept this then the concept of EU supremacy would be different as well. If EU supremacy is just based on Pacta Sunt Servanda, it would be less far-reaching than it is now, because EU supremacy itself has a kind of sovereign claim. But it's, it, yeah. No? Any other questions? No? Okay, then we break for a coffee and we are coming back at in half an hour, 11.30. Thank you.